change the course of, of your research. So why don't you let people know what what was that change? Well, you know, just the uh, largest dolphin species came in and decided to completely <laughs> spoil the party. Um, so, so, of course, yeah, the killer whale or, or Carnus orca, as we know, orcas, they get, they get referred to as either, uh, have really put a spanner in the works down here in South Africa. And, and all those good old days I talked about now are really just sort of a thing of the past because them coming along in 2017, particularly here in Hanswai, um, the white sharks just have not been the same since. So there's, there's increments of time where sort of different chapters of it has evolved and, you know, there's different levels to how the sharks responded. But essentially now here we are in 2024 and Hans Bay doesn't even have white sharks around anymore. If you see them, it's a rarity. And I never thought I'd see that, you know, when I first nope. moved here. I'm sure Dave as well. Yeah, well, the, yeah, the thing I was kind of interested in, we, you and I were speaking at the symposium we were at uh, several months ago in Durban, and uh, because I know when I was doing doing my research down there back in the late 80s, um, you, I mean, there was no shortage of white sharks around False Bay, you know, Hans, by the whole area, there's there's just some areas that were just super hot spots for them. But, but we used to see, they weren't that common, but we used to see orcas around once in a while, and they would, I'd, I'd even watched them feed on sea, uh, Cape Fur Seals at times, but they never seemed to be any, again, indication that they had any influence, they were having much of an influence on the white sharks that time. And you told me something about it was a type of orcas that are now there versus there's like a different types of pods or something. Can you explain that? Sure. People? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, an orca is not an orca when it comes to shark displacement, of course. But um, I, I remember the most incredible talk given by uh, Chris and Monique Fallows here in Hansby and uh, seeing all these amazing photos of lots of orcas in False Bay. And of course, they're all hunting common dolphin or, you know, they're chasing different prey species and they're not mm -hmm. specifically the ones that would hunt sharks. So, of course, mm -hmm. where you are, Dave, in Monterey, I'm sure it's the same. You get a lot of different uh, types of orcas that move through. And, and typically speaking, yeah. they, they coexist. The problem comes right, about yeah. when you get a specific offshore type that is very uh, specialized in hunting elasmobranchs. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. when they start returning back to coastal aggregation sites multiple times within a few years, the sharks respond. And, and they're not just going for great whites, but the great whites have a very specific flight response that they um, that they display in, in, you know, in retaliation to having the orcas come in. Seven gills don't show quite as a, a vivid flight response, but they do. And bronze whalers hardly move at all, which is interesting, um, mm -hmm. or that we know of. So it's um, it's definitely dependent on the ecotype and the, and, the, and the amount of times that, that that killer whale pod or pair or solitary animal return. Uh, and so in South Africa, it's a specific pair of males that came in. Um, and mm -hmm. 2015, they were first recorded off of Cape Town. I know Chris spoke about this with you on a previous podcast. Um, and I saw them for the first time here in Hansby in, in 2015 as well. And I remember being so excited, going getting on a boat and going up behind our island in high insight, thinking about it now, they were definitely hunting sharks, but we didn't know what they were doing because we could just see they were hanging around in a small patch, they were surfacing, and then they were sort of um, creating these slicks and the seabirds were diving, but we couldn't understand what they were eating. And logically, we just thought, well, it's got to be seals. There's a ton of seals around mm -hmm. here. Can't yeah. be the sharks. Yeah. But notably in 2015, the white sharks left our island in, in this region. The only place we could find them was inshore after that. So um, for a couple of years later, that would be the only place until, lo and behold, Port and Starboard. That's the names given to these killer whales, if, if you don't already know that world. Yes. And, um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, so, yeah, the same occurred on the inshore. But this time there was a big difference because um, rather than us going out by boat and tracking them and not seeing anything happen, we had full on white shark carcasses washing out eviscerated with their livers removed, torn open. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first one we necropsied, um, my supervisor, Dr. Malcolm Smale, who Dave knows very well, flew yep. in from Port Elizabeth and he led that necropsy to teach us how to do it properly. And immediately he was certainly saying, this is definitely orca predation. And it was a five meter long animal. I mean, she, we weighed her at the municipal dump and she weighed 1,200 1, kilos minus her liver. Wow. So she, <laughs> that liver must wow. have been a good 90 kilos, you know? Wow. Um, yeah. So impressive and, and fascinating and yeah just all of the emotions around it because now what's going to happen to the sharks are they are they going to stick around and endure this and of course mm -hmm. they didn't mm -hmm. um, but it takes it takes a few attempts the orcas don't drive all the sharks away immediately it happens over a, 
repeat pattern of returning to these coastal bays. Um, so, so Port and Starboard would come in. It was just the two that we know of, right? That the orcas that would yeah. come in, and then they would leave for what months at a time, for years at yeah. a time. Like, do we yeah, know the, little but known to us. I mean, we we often with white shark research, we're very much bay based <laughs> and our mindset right. is very much like i even found that with working on the cage diving boats you'd hear rhetoric like well there's no sharks here today they mustn't be around right because you sat in one spot and you're not getting them but meanwhile if we take the little boat out with the trackers on the sharks we hear that at the cage diving boats but we realize no they're just all in this part of the bay where you can't sit and chum so i think often we you know, we, we kind of base a lot of our mindset of what we think white sharks are doing in these bays, based, sometimes based on opinion, right, or just um, mm -hmm. not actually informed data. So in the bay, what would happen is we'd see port and starboard, we think they're in and then they're out, but actually they're maybe just down the coast a little bit, they're going to circle back in a few months, because their range is extensive. They've been seen from as high up as Luderitz, Namibia, uh, and right oh, the way wow. around to Algoa Bay, Port Elizabeth. So th that's thousands mm -hmm. of kilometers, and they move at speed up and down. So they... And they'll likely spend a bit of time offshore as well before coming back in. And so yeah, they they're extremely proficient predators and um, are, just have this are, absolutely incredible ability to hunt sharks. Are they a part of? Are they part of a larger? Are they part of a larger pod? So I'm glad you're asking all the questions that we don't have answers to <laughs> because <laughs> with the killer whale, no, it's great. With the sharks, it's quite easy to understand what happened. They right. vanished. They fled after repeat um, visits from Port and Starboard uh, in these coastal bays. However, the questions around the killer whale still remain very much open. So we think that Port and Starboard may possibly join with others. We know that from drone footage further on in the in the time frame in Mossel Bay, when we got, we got an aerial um, filming of a predation and it wasn't just Starboard, it was others. So they do, mm. they, they are often seen with another group but we really don't know, for example, and again, I'm speaking on behalf of the killer whale experts, which is wrong. They are going to have a national review paper coming out, which I'm part of, but yeah. they, you know, we don't mm -hmm. know the answers. We don't know where they came from. We really don't know much about their dynamics. Um, have they learned this offshore mm -hmm. at, at longliners, at, at pelagic longliners, and then they've applied their tactics on the inshore? Have they been, are they from Argentina? I always joke about that because... I have this hunch, but it's mm. completely speculative and probably wild and wrong. But um, <laughs> there was one male that had a collapsed dorsal fin in Argentina that was part of a seven gill shark slaughter in one of the published papers by Riz et al. And, uh, you know, they mentioned this male had a bent dorsal. So I always joke, it's, it's probably absolutely not. But anyway, there we go. There's <laughs> speculation and theories. And yeah. the question is, there's so many questions around the orcas and, and, yeah. and where, you know, very little um, that we yeah. know they're really hard to study i mean it's not like you can just chum an orca in like we do with white right. sharks and bang, bang a tag out so simon elwin who's doing a lot of the research here with trying to get the tags on you know he's he's battled he's mm -hmm. been out a lot of times and he's fired and he's hit but then the killer whale comes up to breathe at the same time so the suction cup tag bounces off or sometimes orcas also just bite bling off each other because they can so yeah. you know you go through the whole challenge of getting the tag implanted and however many thousands of us that device costs and now other said orca just comes along and goes, oh, cool, and just bites it off. So <laughs> this looks like that's a fun the challenge to play with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're just too that's smart. It. They're just too smart the, for their the, own the, good. For our have own, you noticed really. them, Beside the shark, have you noticed them taking any of the big stingrays down there? Not that we've seen. Um, I think Dave Hurstbitz in False Bay has footage of them either harassing, I don't know if they consumed the sunfish, not stingrays that mm. I know of, but it would make complete sense if they did forage for them, because obviously we've got huge short tail stingrays here. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's footage of them swimming with a bronze, port swimming with a bronze whaler in his mouth. And then the, the recent mm. work that we have coming out now shows starboard solitarily killing a two and a half meter white shark in less than two minutes, which is by herself. By, on his own. Uh, port on was a good 100 meters or so away on the other side of Seal Island in Mossel Bay. And so, you know, that kind of challenges everything we previously knew about their hunting tactics, because we always right. assume that they have to work together. Yes. Um, and even the drone footage showed from Mossel Bay, three of them coming up with the shark and, you know, they have to get some kind of manipulation point on the animal to open it so, so clean, uh, the pectoral yes. girdle. But this time, Starboard absolutely surprised us because he he literally gripped the pectoral fin of the shark on the surface allowed it to thrash itself open basically 
and he just kept a really solid grip and just kept swimming forward with it. And within two minutes, he dived down and he came up with the lever in his mouth and showed it to the, the boat. It, unbelievable. Man. <laughs> so, so they, are, they are unbelievable, yeah. yeah um, I, and one can't help have um, such respect for them as predators. It doesn't of mean... Course. You know, we, mm. we do get a lot of, we get the two camps here in South Africa on what they believe has caused the disappearance of South Africa's white sharks. It is controversial as a topic. Um, and I believe fully that the orcas or the killer whales are connected to a bigger picture, which is connected to overfishing, which is connected to climate change and degradation. Right. Of Something happened mm. to the oceans to make them come in to the coastal right. seas and now start targeting these sharks. But at the same stroke, this is rewriting some of natural history that we didn't realize happened so quickly. Mm -hmm. And in response to these killer whales, the coastal ecology is really being impacted at a very fast rate. Um, your critically endangered African penguin, for example, is now facing increased predation from Cape fur seals or competition with Cape fur seals for food. And so I guess we just didn't expect all these things were, were able yeah. to happen so quickly here, and they are. And it's all down to lack of white mm -hmm. sharks. Um, I think we all answer that question, don't we? Why? Why do sharks need protecting? Well, guess what? If yeah. they're not around, it's terrifying. Um, so, yeah. I, I was just about—I was just about to say that—is you know everybody's been like, well, what happens if sharks disappear? I had that question a lot, you know, doing yeah. doing talks and things in, in classes, and it's like, well, they 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 have influence on what prey stays in check or stays up or stays down. If they disappear, you don't know what's going to happen to that. In this case, the fur seals get a little; their population kind of explodes, and then you get what you just mentioned right the penguins get get eaten and, and maybe compete yeah. for food with the penguins and yeah it's it's a really interesting dynamic how fragile things are just when one apex predator kind of leaves the leaves the area 100 percent, yeah and it's literally yeah. just giving us a glimpse into ecology in real time even the meso predatory composition here the bronze whaler shark was never seen at cage diving boats now it's the prime species it's just it's fascinating um yeah, yeah. so i I think as much as this topic can be quite, um, what's the word, depressing, because nobody wants mm -hmm. to accept, I guess, that two killer whales or a group of killer whales are responsible for such drastic impacts, the reality is we can't overlook their additional pressure on Southern African white sharks because it's real and it's significant and it's happening more and more frequently. So conservation strategies, models need to take into consideration. This isn't a, a small impact. If they start right. targeting sharks coastally, they don't stop. And I, the one day last year, this exact same time last year, Port and Starboard were just around the corner from here in Pearly Beach. Um, again, just hunting in a localized patch for an hour or two. The next week, 19 seven gill carcasses washed out, eviscerated. 19 of them we necropsied. And it was like, how did they kill that many in a couple of hours? It's, Nothing compared to a fishery, I acknowledge that absolutely. But it isn't great either as an additional pressure on the stocks here. Yeah, and they don't need it. They don't need it. They, they don't. Need it. Yeah. And they don't. Wow. 